Good morning. Welcome to the Interstate Motorway Vehicle Stabilization Kit webinar. It's a beautiful June 2nd. It's uh, supposed to get up to 90 degrees in Chicago today. So it's going to be warm. So I'm stuck in a little room with no AC and a fan going. So if you hear a motor, it's just my fan struggling. My name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the Paratech Training Manager. I'll be going through this uh, interstate motorway kit. It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to discuss the kit, discuss some vehicles. Uh, the bigger kit's going to be next week. As you see, the, the heavy vehicle stabilization kit is going to happen next week, and we are looking to do something a little bit different with that, but we'll take a look to see what we can do. Up and coming webinars. We've got two left in this series after today. The heavy vehicle and the strut driver. We are working on uh, redoing this list for future webinars. So please keep in touch and keep looking at the website and for different things that's going to come up. This is just a PowerPoint presentation. It's for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for hands-on training taught by a qualified instructor. Regular hands-on is necessary to become proficient. Improper use of any of the equipment may cause serious injury or death. Act safe, be safe, and always lift an inch and support an inch. Just a little bit of history. We've gone through this in the last webinars. Uh, for, the, for the people that's been on the last webinars, it's just the history of Paratech. We started in 1962 and evolved to where we are today. As you see on the left, you'll see the timeline of the different things that were happening throughout the years, all the way up to uh, today, which is the, the new control equipment, strut driver, multi-force, hydrofusions, and VSK controllers. We're a, we're a US manufacturer. The manufacturing facility is in Frankfurt, Illinois, which is in the Chicago uh, suburbs. Everything we, we, we make is made there. We've got an office in Denmark that covers, uh, excuse me, that covers Europe and the parts over there that we just ship equipment to. Interstate motorway kit. This is the picture of what it is. This webinar is involving gold struts, as you see there, the long shows. So we've got six uh, long shows there. We got two 36 inch to 50 inch long shows, two 48 inch to 73 inch long shows, two 72 to 116, uh, two 24 inch extensions, sorry, three 24 inch extensions, three 48 inch extensions, six 12 inch hinge bases with anchoring, four multi bases four contour bases, four V bases, two 20 foot grade 100 3A chain with grab hooks, six 27 foot ratchet belts, four die down keys, and two non-slip neoprene pads. Okay, in the previous webinars, we've gone over the Acme rescue struts. Acme rescue struts with the capacity, it's a 20,000 pound capacity up to four feet, the long shows also have got a 20,000 pound workload capacity with a four to one safety factor, but the long shows go up to eight feet. So if you take a look, there are six complete legs ranging from 43 inch to 123 inch in the interstate motorway kit. If you add the legs of the kit, it gives you a support of 120,000 pound workload with a four to one safety. So one to one is 480,000 pounds the six struts will has got the capability to support. So with that, with a two to one safety factor, as well as the acne rescue strut, we can go 40,000 pound up to eight feet. Again, the acne rescue strut is two to one, 40,000 pound up to four feet. The long shows are 40,000 pound two to one up to eight feet. And so you can see as we go through, you see the picture on the right hand side of the under right under the tanker. The long shows uh, doing the stabilization on that. 
Longshore struts are available in five sizes, a 25 to 36 inch, 36 to 50 inch, 48 to 73 inch, and a 72 to 116 inches. 116 inches close to 10 feet. The longshore extensions are available in four sizes, a 12 inch, a 24 inch, a 48 inch, and a 67 inch. So with the longest longshore strut, the 72 to 116, and the longest extension, the 67 inch, you can achieve approximately 16 feet of throw with that strut for supporting a load. All gray bases and heads will fit on the gold longshores. Rule of thumb with extensions we discussed in previous webinars. The rule of thumb with extensions with your Acme rescue strut is the one, two, three factor. One strut, two extensions, not to go over three feet. The rule of thumb with the gold longshore struts is maximum one extension only per strut. That allows you in that system there, in that kit, to get up to 16 feet. 20,000 pound with a four to one safety. Uh, new color coded, easy to read labels. Now the easy to read labels, as you see there, if you can make it out, there's the two to one and the four to one. The old, the old labels on the struts used to have a, a graph or a, a curve line on there, which was hard to read. Now with the new labels, if you take a look close, you'll see two to one at 44,000 pound and four to one at 22,000 pound. That's the actual figures of, for testing on the struts and the Acme rescue struts. It's all color coded now, as you see red, orange and green for the kit. If you take a look at the extensions on the right hand side, it's it's very, very bold and big writing where it gives you a 48 inch extension and a 67, 67 inch extension. Again, they are color coded with green and blue. So for example, if I want uh, the, the 72 to 116 strut, I'd call for the green strut, which is you see the two green bars on the label. And if I want the 67 inch extension, I call for the blue extension with a blue bar on top. Paratech longshore tables. These are the actual figures for the longshore tables. Don't forget before I start on this on the right hand side, check out the chat and there's, there's a team of RSMs there waiting to answer any questions you have. Please give them a little bit of time to reply. They, they're not proficient with typing, so it's going to be a one finger deal. After all, our RSMs actually work better in the field than they do on a computer. So hands on, they are proficient and go through it really fast. On a, on a keyboard, it's a little bit slower, so bear with them. But ask your questions on the chat on the right hand side. So this is the, the table with the actual figures. We got a two to one, three to one and a four to one safety on these. As you see, it goes from six feet to 16 feet. So anywhere below six feet, you get the 44,000 pound two to one or the 22,000 pound four to one. Paratech rescue struts, whether it be the Longshores or the Acme Rescue, got a five year warranty. So there's five years on all the struts, all the equipment that includes the controls. Chains, these are some of the chains that uh, RS, our RSMs have been working with. We try to strive to get equipment that's easy to use and, the, and for the greater capacity of what it is. Sometimes the chains, the 20 foot chains are hard to use with the grab links or the grab hook, sorry, because the grab hook is designed mainly to grab back onto the chain. You create your choke, you grab back onto the chain, you lose about 20% of your capacity doing that. So we are looking at different things where we can utilize chain that carries different hooks. So if you take a look at the, the chains on the left hand side, we've got, we carry two 10 foot chains with, with uh, the slip hook uh, on one side and the oblong and a grab hook on the other side. We also carry two 30 link, 30 link chains with the same orientation, the slip hook 
oblong and a grab hook. We also carry the two different size uh, chain shorteners in, in essence. We get a 3 8 there on the left and a, and a half inch on the right. We try out a new chain that involves a, a frame hook. It's not pictured, but we'll make sure we'll get it pictured for next week's webinar. Now the frame hook that allows to hook directly to the frame. It's easy. You can just reach under, hook on, and do your stabilization. The grade 100 chain is an 8,800 pound chain in a straight pull, in a vertical pull. Hook on, hook on, 8,800 pound. Chains got a four to five, four or five to one safety factor on them. So they are very strong chains. I put a low table on the other side, on the right hand side of the screen, as you see, with a couple of weight blocks. You got a thousand pound weight block. If I got two chains on there at 90 degrees to the load, I get full capacity of the chain to lift a thousand pound. At 60 degrees, as you see, my load decreases to 866 pound. That's just because the stress of the angle on the chains. Those chains will only be able to lift that 866 pound if they are 1,000 pound chains. So on and so forth with the angles. As the angles uh, decrease, so your load on the chain gets greater, which as you see there, the load decreases on the, on the block. So at 30 degrees with 1,000 pound chains, I'm only be able to lift 500 pound at 30 degrees. Then the stre stress on that chain will be too much it's going to want to try to pull your anchors together as it lifts. So that's where that table comes from. Shackles. <clears throat> we use a couple of different shackles. We use the regular, like a Crosby shackle that's on the left with the pin that goes through. And we use the, the web shackle, which is a D-ring shackle. Now that D-ring shackle we use, it will actually fit onto the uh, multi base, it'll go through the hole. That one is a three inch. Three inch is the distance between from eye to eye that the bolt goes through. It'll fit snugly on the on the multi base. Remember to put your, your web in through the, the shackle first. We use these a lot with endless slings. If we sling in a tanker or something like that, we can utilize that on the struts, on the long shores or whatever. The table just below gives you the correct and incorrect way of using a shackle. So if you're using double in a Y, as, the, as you see, the, the second two green arrow shackles, then your two endless slings need to come off in a Y using the curved part of the shackle, then one sling or chain onto the bolt that goes through the shackle. When you tighten these shackles up, you tighten that pin up, you tighten it tight. That's not the correct way to do it. If you tighten that pin tight, make sure you quarter turn the pin back so it's loose a little ways. Otherwise, if you stress that shackle, you will not get the pin out. Rescue strut multipliers. Going back to your, your Acme rescue struts, where we were looking at 45 to 60 degrees for light vehicles. Well, utilizing the, the longshore struts, as I was saying, it's 20,000 pound up to eight feet. And if you take a look at a couple of pictures there at the bottom, where we stabilize in the bus, we stabilize in the cement mixer. Those struts are well over maybe eight to 10 feet, especially the, the one on the bus and the one on the mixer that goes up to the roof line. So this is important now for my, my actual multiplier table. Because if I've got a 20,000 pound load, say, you know, on that mixer, if my, those struts are at 45 degrees, my base is going to see a lot of compression. So for your heavier vehicles, 60 to 75 degrees, then your, your bases don't see as much compression to hold that uh, mixer up. What I would have on that bus and the mixer, also a tie backs going each way to stop lateral movement on them. That allows me to put my rescue struts and my longshore struts up to that 60 to 70 degree, 70 degree, 70 degree mark. 
what that does for me at, at those angles on those struts, there is not a lot of lateral stability going on to those vehicles, especially if they are not symmetrical. If I've got one on one side going out at about 50 degrees and one on the other side going up to 70 degrees, then the 50 degree struts going to push that load towards the 70 degree and you may end up losing your load. That's where tiebacks are critical on heavy vehicles. Especially the one where you see with the bus with the engines in the back, so you're lifting the full weight of that bus with the engine. Vehicle weights, vehicle loads, you all like this table, and the table is available for download. It just gives generic weights of the different axles of different vehicles. Again, I'll brush you over this uh, quickly. For when we use the gold struts, we deal up to 80,000 pounds on the GVW of, a, of a, a semi truck, basically. Take a look at the semi truck, 12,000 pound front end, 17,000, 17,000, 17,000, 17,000 on the trailer gives you an 80,000 pound. So the, 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 the duels on the triples, if you take a look, you got your 12,000 pound, then you got your 20,000 pound on the back end of the tractor, 18,000 pound on the first trailer, 16,000 pound on the first set of wheels, 14,000 pound on the last set of wheels, takes you up to 80,000 pound. So that's the capacity on those doubles. I could not find the capacities on the triples. I'm, I'll still look and hopefully I get it for you for next week. Then you got your school buses, your dump trucks and your cars. Remember, with weights, weights on, on these vehicles, you've, you've got a vision, a visionary uh, app here basically, gives you the weights of the different vehicles of the, of the GVW of the axles. Don't forget to pick the right equipment for the job. Don't use something that's inferior that won't hold the load or lift the load that's at hand. Going back to your weights, intermodal container trucks. Theoretically speaking, you've got an 80,000 pound GVW on these, but be careful when you go up against one of these trucks. Reason is, a lot of the intermodal trucks got orange flashing lights on the roof of the mirrors, also carry wide load placards all over them. Containers are normally packed full to reduce shipping costs from overseas. They are very strong and very symmetrical. They are tough, they, they're virtually bulletproof. If they come off the trailer and roll, they're still intact. So if you're going up against one of these that, that's actually leaning over on top of a vehicle or, or you just need to stabilize one, be sure it's still attached to the wheels of that trailer. There are, there are the pins in each corner, the pins do unlock, make sure they locked in place. Then you can do what you want with them. But what you got to check of if this track, truck and trailer has got wide, plat, wide load placards all over it and the orange flashing lights, they could be upwards of 100,000 pound combined with a 53 foot trailer. So be careful with these. They are dangerous and you don't know what's in them. Don't open the back doors to see what's in there because once you open those back doors, if it's tweaked or twisted, you're not going to close them back up. And then that container is just going to twist on you if you try to support and lift it. Concrete mixes, our favorite thing to train on. Why? Because they are difficult. The trucks weigh anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds and carry anywhere up to 40,000 pounds of concrete in there. Different types of mixes is on the road. We've got the regular conventional drum rear dump. Then we got the six wheel drive with the, with the dummy wheels, front dump. The top one could be a, a six or an eight yard mixer. The bottom one's most probably a 10 yard mixer. If you take a look at the, the bottom table, normally these trucks exert 66,000 pounds on the slab. That means the contact for all tires on that, on that road is gonna be around about 66,000 pounds. Empty truck weighs approximately 27,000 pounds. That's maybe maybe from new. That's without all, all the concrete that's hardened inside the drum. Concrete manufacturers tend to have these drums clean on a regular basis. You've all seen the little hatch, the little hatch that's on the side of these drums. They open the hatch, 
they go in and they basically chip off all the whole the old dry concrete inside then return the truck back to service the distance between the front and rear axles is typically around about 20 feet now these mixers they're held on at the front by about maybe 20 bolts on the motor but they sit onto two pulleys on the back of the the mixer that just sit there so that drum is held on on the back with gravity so if these things roll you'll see that drum moving around if that happens if you do any stabilization on this mixer you need to chain that drum to the to the frame of that mixer again going in the first strut's going to go in is going to be stopping the crush that's a downright and dirty easy strut to push in you're going to go with whatever length strut you've got you're going to go in put it almost vertical or vertical stop that heavy truck crushing further onto the vehicle below it remember every every second that goes by that top load the heavy vehicle on top is still crushing the vehicle on the bottom it may be fresh it may be 20 30 minutes old when it's sitting but it's still bending and crushing that vehicle on the bottom before it comes to actual stop where it can't crush it anymore so with that that stop the crush holds the truck while you get your stabilization in scenario as you see here this is one that i set up in the back we try to try to do things a little bit out of the box what it does for you it gives you different different ways and different ways of thinking outside the box and what you can do to help to get the person out of that red car or people out of the red car in this one we had a dummy in the driver's seat and a dummy in the back seat that basically basically was straddled the jersey barrier so the school bus and the car had to be lifted off the jersey barrier to extricate again you're going to go in to stop the the crush you're going to place your stabilization on the heavy place your stabilization on the light and figure out options of what you're going to do to get that patient out again when you stabilize these vehicles don't put the stabilization in place of your extrication if the idea is to bring up bring the patients out of the side door to the front or the left side of that car don't put your stabilization where the doors are as you see we're using a lot of chain here we're using chain for the bottom car using chain for the top we actually did this scenario a couple of ways with, with a couple of different groups. As you see, we, we've got a rotator there lifting the school bus. That was one of the scenarios where we, we came in and we lifted the school bus with a tow truck. One scenario was just stabilizing everything, lifting the school bus, then lifting the car separately, then extricating. Another group came in and said, well, what if we marry the car to the school bus and just lift the school bus? So we tried that. That worked real well. Just remember, always follow both loads up with both struts. And the last one we did was involved in the tow truck where they married the car to the school bus, lifted the old thing with the tow truck and followed up with the stabilization as it went up and did the extrication. So it's pretty complex and pretty interesting. The interesting thing about it was that the different groups that went through there each had a different idea on how to do this so it was it was cool in the way it worked be careful when you're doing this because if you just lift the school bus on its own that car is going to want to roll on the knife edge of the jersey barrier so make sure that stabilization is in place with our car on the jersey barrier and make sure you are you are going to be able to do the lift to do the extrication Again, this scenario was just a, a coach, a motor coach, just rolling on top of a car. Uh, we did stabilization on both sides. And you see, you can see a hydrofusion in there where they did a lift on the on the car side of the of the coach. Do we extricate in place, or do we remove the smaller vehicle? That's one of the decisions you guys are going to make to what you need to do uh, to extricate the person out of that smaller car. Remember, you've got to extricate the people out of the bus if there are people in the bus as well. So what we did, well, what they did here by the looks is stabilize the bus, stabilize the car, get the car ready to be pulled out or extricated in place. Now they need to lift the bus. So 
if you take a look, there's air going to all the struts, all the stabilization struts. So the one on the, the, the one strut on the dirty side of the bus, when that goes in place, make sure you, you adjust that strut out a ways, then put it in place. So you can actually see about a foot, foot and a half a thread on there. So it both allows you to adjust out and adjust in. Then what they did when they put air to the system, air went onto the struts, they captured the load. As they were about to do the lift, they had firefighters at each strut. Then what they did on the, the clean side where the, where the car is, they adjusted the nut down to capture the load. On the dirty side, they adjusted the nut down about an inch. So there was no resistance for that bus going over onto that strut. So with that, they kept, they kept that under control as they raised the bus off the car. Once the bus is off the car, you tighten up all the collars, lock the bus out, then you can extricate or remove the car. Multiple underrides. Now, if you take a look at the picture on the left, it's the American double trailer. Dub 240 foot trailers being dragged, weighs up to around about 170,000 pound of what's in those trailers. They normally operate in the Northeast. From Ohio East, that's where you see these. You also see, uh, going back to the, the truck loads, you also see the doubles and the triples of the, the pub trailers. Now, as you go east from Ohio through Pennsylvania, you get to see triples. Triples are not allowed west of Ohio. Doubles are, triples are not. So you will see triple containers driving across the Pennsylvania Turnpike and all that. Just allows them to bring more load using just one truck. The one on the right side, <clears throat> this one's an interesting one. Excuse me while I take a, a little drink. Before I talk about this, remember the questions, the answer, the, ask the questions on the, the right hand side of your screen, the questions and answer, and the RSMs are there to answer the questions that, that you got, that you put down. Now this is a Canadian B train. It's virtually, virtually the same as your, your American double trailer. In Canada, these are, the, these are all over the place. They run all over the place. They get accidents all over the place. Double, Underrides, and if you take a look at the stabilization, the amount of stabilization they've got on these, it's the amount of stabilization that's virtually in the interstate motorway kit that we, we carry to hold that B train up. They've got a couple of crib columns under there where they may be putting bags on to do the lift of the B train, and they've got a, they've got a looks like a rotator there trying to support the B train. Now it's hard for that rotator, just for one rotator to come in and lift that B train up without it going squirrely. Because as you see, it's, you've got two recovery straps on there, one to the center of the front, one to the front of the back. If they did that lift, they just going to put more pressure on that, that car on the right hand side to, ex to achieve a, an extrication. So they'd want a couple of tow trucks there to do that, uh, that scenario. So going back to, they're using chain to come around. And if you see chain coming around that tank, you'll just see, take the first strut on the left-hand side on the front of that tank, you just see chain on there. Now, personally, I'd pad out that chain. I put four by fours under there just to give myself a little bit of uh, surface area. That was done on the next scenario. So, they just did this, they took a look, then you stand back. This is a training evolution. You stand back, then you criticize the, the scenario. The firefighters are criticized their own scenario. What could they have done better? What could they have done different? And that's where the pad out of that chain was a little bit different to stop it from creasing that tank. Remember, these, these tanks could be full when you do this, especially that rear, the rear tank on the back where all the weight is coming down to that third strut at that angle, that may be about a 15 degree angle. So you, that one strut is going, going to see about 75% of that load. So that's where you're going you're to watch with these things, especially on these angles and watch with the compression on these bases and make sure you use the right equipment for, for the job at hand.
going back to your chains and everything else. Trailer, trailer load pressure on the sidewall of a trailer. These are some things, some things we play with. The, the actual top pictures you see, you're going to follow the procedures for stop the crush and stabilizing. You're going to catch, capture the suspension on the semi truck. You always lower the landing gear on a situation like this. It helps with stabilization on that trailer. Because no matter where you are in the country or the world, you've got this nice thing called wind. Wind hits the side of that trailer, that trailer acts like a sail. So that trailer is going to move around on you. The landing gear that helps with that. Suspension, if you lock out that suspension, if you block it out, that helps with that. Otherwise, that trailer is just going to rock and roll. Don't forget to lock out that tractor as well. Because the tractor is moving on the fifth plate, the fifth wheel plate, plus the air suspension on that tractor. In this scenario, in this scenario, you see the top scenario, we use the whaler. These are going to be used on your soft side trucks. Reason being because the load in a van trailer on your soft side, soft side trucks may not be secured to the deck of the trailer. So if the trailer rolls, then depending on what's inside, it's going to come to the sidewall where your weight's going to be on the sidewall. So that sidewall was bulging out. So what they did, they put that whaler in place under the chains. So those chains and, and those longshore struts are not only holding the load from dropping, but with those four by fours on the underside, with the pressure of that chain, it's holding the load from protruding through the sidewall of that uh, truck. You do the same with uh, your, your actual soft sided trucks as well, which are get, getting uh, a lot. You see a lot more of them on the road now. They carry steel, they carry anything with those vinyl sides. If you take a look at the bottom, the bottom is just a slope flow strut, flow, slope flow system going in again and doing the same thing, holding the load of that uh, sidewall of that truck. You all remember Billy Leach? I did somewhat similar to this on the first time I met Billy. Billy was a great guy. He always uh, was doing stuff out, out of the box using the tow trucks and everything else. And basically, if you take a look at this, this was an idea that Billy had where he come up to me and, and he asked me, well, can we make a slope floor shore and put under this truck to support each side of that car? I said, let's take a look. I had my trailer. So we put one leg each side of the car. But what we also did, we took a, a trench panel, a fin form that we put down on top of that top rail just to give us some surface area of that load to hold the load of that truck from falling on the car. It worked real well. I just took this one one step further. We're actually doing a slope floor shore using braces and putting it in place. It was a little bit, it was a little bit hard for me to put this one in place on my own, but I put it in place and as you can see the hose is attached to the struts. So the actual slope floor was not adjusted up. I pushed it in as far as it would go till it made contact. Then I opened up my vehicle stabilization controller, which is 25 PSI. Then the rails on top just went up to the to the trailer, supported the load. Then I came in and, and spun the collars down. I spun the back collars down first because it was there, I could reach them. Then I took a pike pole and spun the, the internal collars down. You can also turn the internal collars down if you're using your, your, your Grim Reaper tool or the tie tool we use in trench where we, just, we get grips a hold of the collar, spins it down so you're not actually going under the load. Now this was just a picture I took. I was playing around in the back one day. Now these, these the two front strut, the two front struts you see on this slope floor are going to be anchored to this vehicle on the dirty side of the vehicle. So I can do one or two things. I can actually put a hinge base with anchor ring on the two front ones and attach straps or chains to that and anchor it to the to the, uh, the dirty side of the truck. And on the bottom rails, I can do the same thing or I can just put whalers behind those rails, put a couple of pickets in and hold it in place. Like I said, it was just something I'm playing around with. We're always looking for something 
different and something easy to use. So we capture both horizontal and stable and vertical on both scenarios. Actual incidents. These are just something, again, you've got to think outside the box with these. These are actual incidents that happened. The first picture you see with our car under that concrete block. This happened about a month ago. Uh, here in the Chicagoland area. This is a bridge going over the Des Plaines River in Joliet. Where that's a counterweight on the bridge. So that that is normally up on top. As the bridge opens, it opens up like a drawbridge. The counterweight comes down to help the hydraulics, but the car decided to try to beat the red the red light and go through. As you'd see, it broke the barrier. The concrete weight came down on top of the car, trapped the people in the car. So this is something <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of, but who knows in this industry what's going to happen with these with, with people and, and vehicles and some of the scenarios you get. The middle one was an actual up in Minnesota. This was a shopping mall. I think this was the Mall of America, where you got the parking lot on the right hand side, you got the mall entrances on the left hand side. Person got into the car and put it into drive instead of reverse and decided to take the car into the shopping mall. Again, it's 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 an easy stabilization. This car's pretty stable as it is, but you don't know what sort of wall that is. If you take a look at the wall, the wall is just decorative wall. So you don't know if the front of that car is going to drop. It's nice and high, so we use they use the long shows, the, the 72 to 116s with an extension on to go up to just stabilize that while they got the people up. The one on the right side is an actual. Don't ask me what happened here, but you got the sprayer was there and you got the car decided to drive under the sprayer. Now it could have been worse than what it is. Those sprayers, they they tend to go at a, at a, at a click down these roads. They're pretty quick. So if that car hit and that back wheel ended up in the cockpit of that car, especially if that sprayer tank was full, there's a lot of moving parts on there you've got to stabilize. Because you don't know if the sprayer arm is loose, the hydraulics on the sprayer arm is going to come out. You got ladders, you got the big donut tires, you got the suspension. So there's a lot involved with doing a stabilization on that sprayer truck. Optional equipment we use. So optional equipment we use, if you take a look, I put the bipod kit in there. The reason excuse me, I put the bipod kit in here, is because every time I do a heavy vehicle class, they want to see the bipod. They want to bring the bipod out. What can we do with the bipod in different positions or this, that, and the other? So I put the bipod kit there and three pictures. The bipod kit is used with the gold long shows. If you take a look at the bipod kit, it's got gold bases and gold heads. The gold bases and gold heads of any kit that we do, if the heads and bases are gold, they will not work with your Acme rescue struts, with the gray struts. They'll only work with the gold longshore struts. And the reason behind that is that the kits we make with the gold bases and heads are to utilize the length and the capacity of the gold longshore struts. The bipod, as you see the first picture, lifting that tank off the car, propane tank. Second, second picture on top, is removing a coil, a spindle coil off of the car. And the bottom one was a car rolled, trapped the person in the, the pit you see there. It was in a confined space, hard to stabilize, hard to do a lift. So they asked if they could see if the bipod would do it. So that worked pretty well. I actually run that scenario. And we had a grip hoist going both ways. We leaned the bipod over, attached the chain tight to the bipod in the car. As we pulled one way and went with the grip hoist and released, released the other way, it actually not only lifted the car up but moved the car off the pit. Again, we stabilized as we went just in case anything happened with the chains. It was a pretty cool scenario, it worked real well. And it, it, it did work real well. So they, they did that and a couple of options. Another option, one of, one of the the crews did on this 
is they straddle the bipod over the car and just lifted the car directly up with the grip hoist and the snatch block. Going back to that top right hand uh, picture with that coil, is that's a wire coil. So that was, I can't remember the weight of it, maybe in the 15 to 20,000 pound mark, but they had different weights. Because as you see a flatbed rolling down the road with just that one sheet coil that's in the center, the weights of those go up to around about 50, 55,000 pound. So they are pretty heavy. So with that, you again, you've got to watch your, your load capacity of your actual equipment you're using. Not only the struts, but the chains, the grip hoist, snatch blocks and everything else. So follow up, that's going to be the end of the webinar. Follow up email from your local regional sales manager. Ask any questions here. We'll still be open for about 15, 20 minutes for questions on this. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you got something from it. Again, these webinars are just there for a PowerPoint. So you can take a look. Something you've seen, something you haven't seen, some ideas, this, that and the other. That's where we get the questions from. That's where we get the answers from. And if we haven't got the answers, then we, we resource the answers and get the answers to you. Again, a link link to a recording of this webinar will be out there. And please check out our website for future webinars. And again, thank you for joining me on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Uh, we look forward to the next one next week. Here's just some of the different uh, scenarios we've got that's there. Uh, the one on the top right, top left, you're going to come up to a lot where you got the underwrite, then the truck's going to uh, hit your underwrite. And that same thing happened with the second one. The third one's an actual, with two vehicles involved going into a house. Then we got a tanker rollover, we got the cement truck, and we got another actual, which is the bottom right picture with, I don't know what happened there, but how that guardrail coiled itself around that SUV, I don't know, but that's something we need to ask. Always check out paratech.com and we're good to go. Thank you.